Well, good morning and um, blessings on this last day of 2023. Um, don't know, thinking about what I would talk about this morning, um, there was some fairly obvious things that I could talk about, it being the last day. Um, generally, we talk about change. What do we want to do differently in this coming year? Um, you generally try and hit them hard after the feasting and merriment of Christmas when they're feeling guilty for their overindulgement. But um, that's not what I want to talk about. We could talk about the joy that we've experienced in this past year. We've been blessed with 365 days that none of us were guaranteed. And we're looking forward into a new year that God may or may not grant us. Um, so we've been, well... In fact, we probably mentioned already in about every song we've sung, in some way, shape, or form, we talked about it um, in Sunday school. Josiah mentioned it in devotions. And um, it's an area we all wish to grow in this coming year. It's a key in how we relate to God. Um, When I ask you to describe the character of God, attributes of the character of God. What things come to your mind? Love, Love yes. Holy. Holy. Faithful. Faithful. Powerful. Powerful. Kindness. Kindness. No one has said yet strict, uncompromising, vindictive, authoritarian. Why is that? Is God those things? Is he? Does he he have an unalterable law that we have to adhere to? Yes. But why don't we refer to him as that? I was thinking about an analogy that I could possibly use for this. And say if we, we decide to have a baking competition and one of the categories is a gluten free cake. How many of you prefer a gluten-free cake to a cake with, a, with gluten in? Not many. Um, so I enter the competition and I say, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to smoke them. I'm going to put gluten in my cake. I'm going to make it with real flour and it's going to be nicer. Well, anyhow, the judge comes along. He notices it's got gluten in and I'm disqualified. Why? Isn't that strict? Isn't that authoritarian? Well, no, the rules were there. You have to adhere to the rules in order to be able to compete. And so God's not strict. He created the rules, and we have to adhere to the rules. And so, yes, if someone has infinite power, has infinite responsibility, is the creator of all things, then he gets to call the shots. And so what I want to talk about is obedience. Um, Obedience to God and the structure of obedience in, in God's, God's world, how he wants us to, to obey, why he wants us to obey. And so, yeah, it's, it's a very basic, simple subject, but it, it feeds into each area of our lives. Even, even Silent Night, a song that has virtually no, um, no doctrine, um, talks about the obedience of Christ in coming. Um, it's, it's everywhere. And so the most obvious reason why to obey God is because he deserves it. But I want to talk about um, why God places the importance on obedience that he does. God's a God of unfathomable love. Yet he requires us to do exactly as he tells us to do. Isn't that a bit of an anomaly? Why would he do that? Um, Ask us to do things which he's able... Ask us to obey strict rules that he's able to forgive us. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. What is the value of obedience to God? What is the value of obedience to us? So I think we'll go... We'll start with examples. Um... We think of Adam and Eve. They disobeyed when they took the fruit. I'm just going to list a few. These are some that 
instantaneously came to my mind. It doesn't take long to think of examples of disobedience in the Bible because they're there to teach us. Um, I thought of Achan, and he took gold and a garment, and he hid them under his tent when he had been strictly told not to, and he was punished. Dathan and Abiram um, went against Moses, and they disobeyed well, God's structure of order that he had placed. David saw Bathsheba. Um, he lusted, he disobeyed, and was punished. David and the census. Solomon and his foreign wives. In his desire for peace, he disobeyed God's injunction not to marry foreign women, but he, he acquired quite a catalog of women. Moses struck the rock because of his fury with Israel. Again, he disobeyed. Jonah, because of his hatred of Nineveh, because of his fear of what they might do to him, perhaps, disobeyed God and fled. Now, what's the, what's the common denominator to each of these? So as a common denominator I saw, there's probably more. Um, and you could probably think of more examples, again, of disobedience. But the common denominator that I saw was when disobedience comes, immediately loss of relationship with God comes. Perhaps it came back again afterwards through repentance. And I think repentance is a form of obedience. It's, it's an obedience, it's a subjection of the mind to God before, perhaps before the actions come. There's the story of the thief on the cross. And he repented, though his, his actions were virtually not there. There was still this obedience that he, that he practiced, even, on that, even as he was dying on the cross. And God blessed that. Another example I thought of from the New Testament is the rich young ruler. So he rejected what could have been an incredibly close relationship with God, walking with, walking with Jesus every day, because God asked too much of him. He couldn't give that. And so I think studying this, I, my mind went down various bunny trails. It's such a huge subject, but... My, the, what I wanted to convey was that God is a God of infinite authority. God is also a God of infinite love. He requires us to be obedient so that we can have relationship. Obedience is essential for relationship with God. Obedience is not essential for God's love, though. God loves anyway. Why don't we turn to our Bibles? Um, let's look at another example of disobedience. This is Saul's example. This is um, 1 Samuel chapter 15. And I will begin reading in verse 20. And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and gone on the mission which the Lord sent me, and brought back King Agag, king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the plunder, sheep and oxen, and the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is an iniquity and an idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed your voice and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. It 
This is pretty strong. Stubbornness is as idolatry. Have you equated those before? How many of you are stubborn? Probably all of us, if we're honest. Um, We've been rebels, and that's like witchcraft. Why is that? What idol did um, Saul put up in this story? It's not a physical idol, but he put up an idol. His own idea? Popularity. He wanted the people to like him. Um, And he decided that was more important than having a relationship with God. And that... Obedience is a huge concept somewhere out there. But when it comes to me being stubborn, it comes right back here. Um, It's a very physical thing that I struggle with on a regular basis. And yet God says that's idolatry. Um, and so then that plays in again to this, this structure that I want, want, want everyone to be able to remember when they go home. That God is infinitely loving. He has infinite authority. We obey because of his love, because of our fear of God and his authority. And through that we can have relationship Saul here didn't obey and put up another idol. God values relationship. Um, and I want to read, a, um, read briefly from a, uh, a Danish Christian philosopher of the 19th century. Um, his name was Søren Kierkegaard, and he was fairly famous in his time. But he writes writes quite interestingly about, about Christian philosophy, I suppose. And this is what he writes about choice. A choice. Do you mean, my listener, know how to express in a single word anything more magnificent? Do you realize, even if you were to discuss year in and year out, how you could mention nothing more awesome than a choice? What it is to have a choice. For though it is certainly true that the ultimate blessing is to choose rightly, yet the faculty of choice is still the glorious prerequisite. What does it matter to the young lover to take inventory of all the outstanding qualities of her fiancé if she herself cannot choose? And on the other hand, whether others praise her beloved many perfections or enumerate his faults, what more magnificent thing could she say than when she says, he is my heart's choice. A choice, yes, it is that pearl of great price, yet it is not intended to to be buried and hidden away. A choice is not used in worse... A choice that is not used is worse than nothing. It is a snare in which a person has trapped himself as a slave who did not become free by choosing. It is a good thing that you can never be rid of it. It remains with you, and if you do not use it, it becomes a curse. A choice not between red and green, not between silver and gold. No, a choice between God and the world. Do you know anything in comparison to choice? Do you know of any more overwhelming and humbling expression for God's condescension and extravagance toward us human beings than that he places himself, so as to say, on the same level of choice with the world, just so that we may be able to choose. That God, if language dare speak thus, woos humankind, that he, the eternal strong one, woos sapless humanity. Yet, how insignificant is the young lover's choice between her pursuers by comparison with the choice between God and the world? So two things that I'd like to point out from that reading. Firstly, the value of choice. Um, He uses the example of a fiancé talking about the one she loves. How many of you young men, if you had one choice, would have the same value, place the same value in the woman you had decided, or you young ladies in the man who 
was interested in courting you if he was the only one, if there was no choice. The value is put there largely because you have made the decision that, that is the one you want. And that's the value that God, that God sees in us when we've made the decision to follow him. To have created a world that simply followed him would have not been as valuable to God as a world that chooses to follow him. What does disobedience indicate? And we talked about this already somewhat, but it's the putting up of other idols. And that might be popularity, like Saul. It might be wealth, like Achan. It might be myself, and that's probably the most often one. Is Well, and it pretty much always stems back to myself. Um, fear of others, or desire for something that makes my life better. Um, let's look at the first epistle of John, um, and chapter 2. And I will read a few... Let's begin in verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. It's the way to avoid idolatry in our lives, is to follow the example of Christ. That's when we know we're in him, when we're, when we're following Christ, is when we have that, that desire to follow, when we can see we follow, when those around us see we follow. I wanted to... Um, I suppose, look at a particular book in the Bible um, in regard to this. Or perhaps I'd first mention the relationship with God. This, this thing we're seeking, this thing we're obeying to have. Um, I think it, it comes up again and again in the Bible, the blessings of a relationship with God. But just yesterday, for our family devotions, we were reading um, from Psalm 1. And, well... The man who keeps God's commandments, who doesn't, doesn't look for what the scornful looks for, for what the proud man looks for, is like a tree planted by a river of water, the river of water, the river of life, who has roots going down into that water and is forever, forever growing, forever fresh because it has that relationship with God. If we're not like that, we're like chaff um, when we don't place value in our relationship with God by obeying. There's a particular book of the Bible that talks a good bit about obedience. Um, I enjoy this book. It's the book of Jonah. Um, you can turn there. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll skip through it. Um, I find the book of Jonah somewhat refreshing as I'm going through the minor prophets you suddenly come across a narrative. Um, it's telling this far-out story of a man who got swallowed by a whale. But it's also um, a glimpse into God's bigger plan. We have a book that, we have a book that was largely written to the Jews. Um, the Bible is well, up to about, the, well, even the end of the Gospels. It's a Jewish holy book. And the impression we can get is, you know, the Gentiles are the scraps on the outside. God has no plan for the Gentiles. But then we come upon books like Jonah that say, well, actually, God did have a plan for the Gentiles. It's a different plan, but he had a plan all along. Um, and there's other books, too. Obadiah is talking about the Edomites. There's a book of Nahum, too, which is entirely for the Gentiles as well. God had a plan, and I think... A lot of it, a lot of what we read about the Gentiles is condemning, but what's the point in condemning if you don't, 
if you don't want them to move from there, um, it would be a waste of time for God. So I'm, I'm, it's an encouragement to me that, to know that God has always had a plan for the Gentiles. Um, it's not a case of, hey, presto, we're going to start using them after all, um, after Pentecost, or after, after Cornelius. So looking at the book of Jonah, um, verses 2 and 3, Jonah's told to go. Jonah says, no, I'm not going, um, for various reasons. Fear. At the end, we can surmise that he was, um, he was scared that God would not kill them off because he went to preach, and that's what happened. And he says, I knew you were, I knew you were kind. I knew you would let them. Um, you would, you would uh, forgive them. And so he was annoyed. And so this running away could have just been, he wants the Ninevites not to have any form of salvation whatsoever. So he's going to go the opposite direction. He's going to go to Tarshish instead of going to Nineveh, which is on the River Tigris, the other direction. Anyhow, the storm blows up, and the sailors come up in verse 6 and say, Pray, Jonah, pray, pray. Do you think God heard Jonah? He was a prophet of the greatest, the greatest God any of them were representing there. Jonah prayed, we can assume. Did anything happen? No. He had severed his relationship by, with God by disobeying and going the opposite direction. Anyhow, they're tossed around for a while longer. They try to row to shore probably to get rid of Jonah. Um, they can't. Jonah realizes what needs to happen, and so he says, chuck me into the sea. And so that's what they do. Then we go on to chapter 2, and we have a prayer of Jonah. And this prayer is a prayer of repentance. Um, he cries out to God because of his affliction, and God answers him because Jonah has had a change of heart. He no longer wants to disobey. Um, God has restored that relationship through Jonah's repentance. Um, verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you in your holy temple. I don't know this for certain, but why do you think Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days? I think it was partially because he was a very stubborn man and that it took him a while to actually come to the stage of repentance um, to, to get to that depth of despair, even within the belly of the whale, to say, Lord, I need your help. Um, I will do what you want me to do. And then verse 8 is coming back to the whole thing of idolatry. When we, when we are stubborn, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. I don't know whether any of your Bibles capitalize the mercy, but my one does. Um, the forsaking of God, forsaking of mercy by worshipping idols. Then we have chapter 3. Jonah goes into the city. He starts preaching. He's obedient. Uh, verse 5 to 10, the Ninevites return to God. They do it at a grand scale. Um, the oxen are not drinking, not eating. Everything is wearing sackcloth and asses. And in verse 10, God saw their works and they turned from the evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. God recognizes obedience. God recognizes repentance. And then chapter 4, we go on to Jonah. And Jonah has a really bad attitude. Um, He's angry with God because God didn't do exactly what he wanted him to do. He didn't wipe out the Ninevites as he had told the Ninevites they'd be wiped out. Um, yet God talks to him. Why do you think that is? I think it's because Jonah was obedient even if he was angry, which is interesting. Um, 
God respects obedience to the extent that even if you're angry with him, he still will have relationship with you. And so that's a prerequisite. Even if your heart isn't right, if you're obedient, I think God honors obedience and will have relationship with you. My, uh, my next thought on this was, I suppose developing this thought is our duty to teach obedience. We have a duty to practice obedience, but we also have a duty to teach obedience. Jonah was called to go to Nineveh. That's a fairly obvious example we saw in Jonah. Um, many other prophets, tens, hundreds probably of prophets, were called to go and do God's work. The apostles, the disciples. Matthew 28 tells us to go and teach others obedience. Then I thought about our church, and I thought about the fact there's a lot of children here. Has anyone else noticed that? A lot of children in our church. Have any of you come across um, pyramid graphs? Um, You have their bar charts with uh, male and female ages, and you put them back to back. So essentially you have the zero to four bracket here with men and women, and it's and then so on and so forth, and you build up the way instead of a bar graph going the other way. And so it ends up in, in what they call the developing country looking like a pyramid because there's a lot of people who are zero to four, and it builds up to maybe one or two who have managed to make it to 90. Well, and then you have um, a German population, <laughs> and it has a lot of people who are 80s and 90s because of wonderful health care, and then they have a falling birth rate, so it comes down to very few who are zero to four-year-old on the male and female side. Well, I thought, if you were to draw one, this would probably be a good one for geography class, Josiah, if you were to draw one of our church, it would look a bit like a birthday cake. There would be a candle in the middle with the, with the 70s and the 60s and the 50s and so on, and then suddenly it hits 30 and it would be wide. Um, there's all the 30-year-olds and 20s and 10s and so on, on the way down to lots of young people. What's our primary... Our primary um, I suppose, audience as we teach obedience if we're a parent. Children, Children, yeah. And I think that this structure holds true as we train our children. What is child training other than teaching our children to make good decisions to know God. And this structure of authority, obedience, relationship holds true for that. What do we call using a relationship to extract obedience? We call it manipulation. Um, is that child raising or is that not child raising? Um, what do we call, in a, in a family where, um, where child raising hasn't occurred and where a parent wishes to establish a connection with their child, well, then we've turned this upside down and the parent will obey the child so that it can have relationship with the child. We could remove obedience and then we end up with something of a peer relationship which doesn't work when you're training a child. And yet we live in an era where a lot of people are moving away or a lot of people, for better or for worse, um, are reacting to the way they were brought up. I think that's a good thing because it shows the ability to think independently, to see the faults that your parents had, because they had them. But at the same time, we shouldn't lose sight of the structure that God has ordained for the raising of children. There needs to be obedience in order to have relationship. If that doesn't exist, then we're not training our children. Either they're training us so that we can better cater to their desires 
or we start manipulating them to try and get a semblance of, resem- a semblance of obedience, which is not what we want as parents. I had two questions that I wanted to ask somewhat on this. One goes back to Jonah. Did Jonah, did did God show Jonah more love when he sent the storm or when he allowed Jonah to be spat up by the whale? Was he demonstrating love? Was more love shown by sending the storm to stop Jonah going to Tarshish or was more love shown when God eventually let Jonah out of the whale's stomach? I think it was the one that looked harsher. It was, God said that, Jonah, you're not a basket case. I can actually redeem you, and so I'm going to send a storm, even though that's not what you want. And that's what, that's what each of us wants God to do for us, is be mean so that, he, so that we can restore that relationship with God. And I think that applies to child training. There's, you have to push You have to be mean. You have to send that storm so that you can create this, so that you can bring back relationship. Another interesting verse is John 3, verse 17, which follows God so loved the world. God says, I didn't come to the world to condemn the world, or Jesus says that. How did Jesus talk to the Pharisees? Does it sound at all condemning when he says, whitewash sepulchre or um, full of dead men's bones does that sound condemning it does but God just said I haven't done that I think God was trying to restore relationship with the Pharisees when he said that I think that's what he knew was what they wanted what, what they needed to hear he needed to hear or they needed to hear their hypocrisy and that direct way that um, that conflict was how he was going to restore that relationship. And the Pharisees weren't there. Well, he talked to Nicodemus, and there's others who we know he spent time with, but the Pharisees were not ready to repent. But God was looking for them. God was searching for relationship with them when he said, you're a whitewashed sepulcher. And so my encouragement to each of you parents here is embrace conflict. Um... That's embrace conflict to restore obedience because that's how God has structured the family. That's how God has structured our relationship with him and has structured our relationship with our children. I think in closing it would be good to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Um, We have... Words from the uh, the wisest man. And he puts his finger on the most important thing, our whole duty. Start in verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So, the book of Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon has just spent the whole thing thrashing around what's good, what's worthwhile, um, what's vanity, what's not vanity. Um, And it boils down to this. It's that simple. Fear God, keep his commandments. And that's the key to relationship with him. And so that's that's my New Year's thought for you. Um, Continue in obedience. Seek more obedience. Um... And ask for God to, to send storms so that that relationship can be built, so that you can draw closer to him. Can I ask you to stand for